Cool. Um, yeah, I, I guess it's about how long do you think generally sh we should wait? Um, I think we should give them the full. I don't see anyone else joining now. Um, and I guess if somebody does join, we can we can add them and bring them in during the during the call. Um, I'll yeah. keep my eye on the on the thing. Um, yeah, I think okay. it's, it gets uh, and we have I think we have everybody we have Udit here, so that's that's going to be good. Um, yeah, so uh, I, I guess uh, this is uh, this is uh, my first uh, one of of these, I guess. Um, and so forgive me if um, there are any technical difficulties or. Uh, you know, if the meeting doesn't flow as smoothly as it should or whatever. Um, but I think for the agenda, it's kind of also, oh, here we go. We got somebody joining too. Oh, it's Lauren. Nice. Um, we, um, we're going to give you a rough overview of the informal hub team's work uh, in, the, in the past two weeks. But given this is the first one, um, we may go a little bit further than that. Um, we also, uh, Udit will also be giving uh, an overview of HIFA's work. And then also, uh, in particular, what test nets have been going on and stuff like that. Um, we have a check-in with consumer chain teams, um, as well, I guess I, I guess I'll just share my screen and put the agenda on it. Um, maybe that's a good idea. Um, yeah, so we have a, we have a, we have this item on the agenda, checking with consumer chain teams. However, I don't actually see any representatives from any consumer chain teams here. Um, and they, um, so, so we're not necessarily, I can tell you about them um, from our perspective, but I guess we're not necessarily going to have, um, have, have a check in with them directly unless they show up. Um, okay, so the overview of our work um, past two weeks, we have been, um, we've been doing, a, we've been doing a few things. Oh, sorry, it goes to, it goes to my screen sharing, goes to, to pause when I go to another, well, okay, whatever. So we've been, um, We've been doing a few different things. Um, we've been a lot of what we've been dealing with is kind of. Um, well, I mean, you know, this is this is actually more than two weeks ago now. But the uh, neutron launch was a big one. Um, we also had the um, during the neutron launch, we had the the multi den fix, the emergency upgrade that we got out. Um, so that's now. Those were both now like you know uh, more than two weeks ago. In the past two weeks, we've sort of been uh, consolidating the consolidating a lot of the progress that's been made and, and, and kind of getting integrated. Um, we've been preparing a interchain security 1.2 release, um, which, which integrates uh, a lot of the development that's happened since the launch of interchain security, uh, as well as um, some of these fixes. Um, and then also in particular, we've been writing migrations for, for new features we've made, um, because now that we're in production, we have to be a lot more careful about that. Um, we had a, we had an issue in a, in a neutron test net that resulted from a missing migration. So um, we've also been uh, we, during the past two weeks, um, we, uh, you know, along with the help from the notional team, got the uh, 47 upgrade um, out. Right now, it's not integrated into main directly. Uh, it's at a there, there's a branch that has the 47 upgrade stuff in it. Um, that will be it's being used by um, by Stride right now for testing, I believe. Um, that will be landing in in Interchain Security 1.3, um, and it's uh, so so 1.2 is kind of a consolidation and um, yeah, an integration of all the stuff we've built since launch, and then 1.3 will be adding in 47 on top of that. Um, and there's, there's a bunch of random stuff. Um, I guess maybe I can let Mattia or Milan go more into particular features um, if people are interested. But there's you know stuff like supporting cancel and bonding. That's a new thing in 47 um, where people can cancel their unbondings. We want to support that. Uh, we've also prepared a uh, Gaia um, the V9.11 release um, with the uh, with the Huckleberry fix. Um, and we're also working. It's on the forum already, but the props not out. We have you know, it's going to be on the forum for, 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 for a week, I believe, uh, which has the, um, the, the V10 release. Uh, we, we have the, the, the forum prop out for V10. And V10 is just um, kind of a bump of all of our dependencies. Um, it's just, yeah, we're just bumping everything we can in, in V10. Um, so, so no major new features, just bumps. Um, and the uh, SDK 45.16 in particular was one we... Um, was the one we really wanted to adopt. So, um, oh, cool, someone else is joining. Um, 
And then one other thing we've, we've been working on is liquidity module um, removal, the governance signaling proposal. And we've, um, we've put that, um, I don't know if we have that publicly anywhere yet, but that's an interesting one uh, because what's happened there is we have this liquidity module, which is the gravity dex, um, if you, you might remember that. And that liquidity module was, I mean, it hasn't been used for like a year now. Um, and it it has um, it has um, basically uh, has money in there that people haven't withdrawn. And last time we estimated, it was about, or it was actually the liquidity uh, uh, the liquidity devs, uh, Dong Sam. I think I think they're working at Crescent now, um, but they're, they're they're helping us with this. The last time they estimated it was about hundred grand, hundred thousand dollars worth of unclaimed tokens in there, and. 99% of those tokens, it's possible to run a migration that just forces force withdraws them, just returns them to their owners, um, takes the LP tokens away and gives them the regular tokens back. Uh, but there is 1%, which are in addresses that we can't attribute uh, or that the liquidity devs can't attribute a solid owner to. And um, so uh, some of those addresses are like IBC escrow accounts. So people are holding LP tokens out of the chains. And I think some of them are other module accounts that may have been where somebody accidentally sent LP tokens to a module account um, or something like that. Um, but in any case, that's about $1,000 worth. And so during the migration um, that we're proposing in the signal proposal, that $1,000 worth of tokens is going to be um, sent to the community pool. And so uh, if, somebody wants to, uh, if, if somebody wants to present evidence that that's theirs, it might be a little bit more complicated to review. That, and we can't really do it automatically, um, but they can they can you know make the governance proposal uh, for community spend to to get those tokens back so they can prove their ownership, and um, so that's another thing we've been working on, and and we have been writing the code for that. Uh, that's been liquidity devs, but uh, just coordinating that process, and so we'll we'll be bringing that prop out too. Um, yeah, and, and any I could go also on on products on product work or, or thinking for stuff that's you know months in the future and stuff, but I'm wondering. Um, well, first of all, Mattia and, and Milan, is there anything I've missed that I should mention before we go to questions? I wouldn't say you missed, but you just misspoke. So with ICS, it's not going to be a 1.2. With all of the latest changes, it's going to be V2 because we are following Semver. Oh. So in order to actually yeah. respect the Semver, it's going to be V2. And for 47, it's actually going to be V3. Because there's state breaking changes, and whenever we have a state breaking change, it's a major version bump by Semver. So there's just a nuance there. Oh, I don't know why I was thinking that the one point stuff. Yeah, never mind that. Cool. So V2, ICS, Interchain Security V2 and V3 are coming out. So uh, just kidding, because you used to use that terminology for you know opt in security and, 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 uh, and layered security. But okay, so. Um, yeah. Any questions about the the sort of uh, technical stuff I've 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 reviewed here from the from the call participants? So is V eleven going to be with SDK forty seven? Is that the idea, John? No, no, probably not. Um, we 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 need to. Um, I, I can't I can't say that for sure. Um, v10 V10 is one we're trying to do it really easy because we just want to bump the depths and like get that done with. Um, v11, I'm not sure if it's going to be 47. Um, I think we are pretty close to having 47 for uh, for Gaia um, as well as ICS. A lot more work to do the ICS than the Gaia guys just like you know, um, you know, calling calling other libraries basically. But um, I can't say for sure it's going to be in V11. Um, I think we still we still want to do a little bit more uh, sort of an internal audit maybe on SDK 47. Uh, the reason is that very few chains have adopted 47 so far, and um, it's uh, it, it's it, we 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 do want to we do want to do a tiny bit of due diligence on it before we 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 adopt it on the hub. But there's definitely stuff in there we want. Um, one of the big ones is like I mean cancel and bonding will be cool for users definitely um and then also stuff like um there's there's stuff that really enables where we want to go in the future so um the governance improvements in 47 are going to be great uh and then also the um 
there's other stuff too. There's like the, um, there's this thing with distribution, which will enable opt-in security uh, where validators can be individually given rewards instead of giving it to everybody at once. Um, and there's a bunch of cool stuff, but yeah, we, we, we may want to do a little bit more review before we say for sure that V11 is going to have 47 in it. Um, and uh, yeah, it's 47 hasn't been audited, but at the same time, no SDK version really has been audited. So it's, um, yeah, that's where I, I'm wondering any other teams, uh, what's your, do you have any more update? I was, remember we, we looked at, uh, um, we were looking at a thing yesterday from, uh, we got from the chain registry um, on who's running 47, um, 46 and 45, very interesting. But I was wondering if, if any other teams have any insights uh, on where 47 is in production yet. Um, like, you know, I see people from Strange Love and Notional here. Uh, uh, hey, yes, uh, I got some update from Stripe team. Uh, we at Notional and Stripe are working on upgrading SK47 for their chain right now. So they have a developing branch and doing some testing. And they are planning to ask uh, LSM module on the chain for the 47 version two. Yeah, actually, if I could ask you, I know that you were doing uh, some work backporting the LSM to 45. Um, so it could go on the hub even before 47. Um, is, is that still the plan? Uh, yeah, I believe that the strike team is planning a call with Jacob on that uh, 45 LSM launching. Yeah, I mean, they they did mention that they're going to have an audit first before actually launch it. So that's yeah. great. Yeah. So the question then is, be, you know, do you do you audit the 45 or 47 version, I guess? Um, yeah. So, yeah, that, that is one of the things that we need to um, we we sort of need to uh, get some more certainty on is um, is 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 when when 47 goes on the hub and I, I feel personally like, uh, and this is just an opinion here, but like that the hub has almost functioned as the SDK test net in the past, um, or it would be like the hub would upgrade and then everyone else would be like, okay, I guess we can run this now. Um, and I, I don't know though, if it makes sense for one of the largest chains to also be the first to adopt uh, a new SDK versions when no one else is running them yet. Um, but at the same time, um, I think, if we can determine that the auditing that's been done on 47 is uh, sufficient and everything looks good, um, then I suppose there's no reason not to. But yeah, that's still, that's something we, we definitely need to address. Um, isn't, isn't that what the Juno chain was supposed to become? The, the test chain for new SDK versions and new features? I think, well, I don't know. I think they're still on 45 though. So um, yeah, I don't know how up to date our data is. It comes from the chain registry, but the, I think it's pretty I can give some. I can give some Juno update if you want. I think the plan oh, yeah. is to be very progressive on Juno. Yes. So I think uh, Jacob and Reese and some other guys are working on upgrading. Yeah. I think that's the latest status for Juno. I think there's some more chains too, like White Whale. I think. Mm. I have a question about. Uh, mm -hmm. 47, is there like an overview somewhere where you can see what versions all chains are on? Um, I, I can, um, so Ethan, Ethan Buckman actually, he has a script. He was showing me this yesterday and he has a script, which maybe you have access to it too, Greg, but it, it just Greg, uh, Greg Zabo here is his security um, and informal, but uh, it's, it's basically, uh, he, it, apparently the script just parses uh, the chain registry from GitHub. So, Ooh, um, yeah, so as long as chains are keeping that chain registry up, that chain, reg I'm not too well versed in what the chain registry is used for, but I believe it's used for uh, helping, you know, relayers get set up and stuff like that. Probably other people here know more about it than, than me, certainly Justin Thierry, who I see here may know more, um, but uh, as long as the chain registry is up to date. It, it, yeah, it shows right. also, um, it, or, you know, the version shows up in um, on on Minscan as well, so block explorers have versions of what SDK and so on and so on you're using. Greg, Greg, you gotta unmute yourself if you're. Yeah, your so I actually have an update on that. So 
It's not a script, it's a Go application that Ethan used to use. You can find it under Cosmos slash chain parse. You can build it yourself and, and run it if you wish. Um, and it will give you a bunch of interesting information about uh, chains based on the chain registry. There is the chain registry also has a web interface. I can't really recall chain director or something that you can use. And we're also building a tool. Give me a week or two and then I can show it off which is mainly for security purposes, but it's going to do exactly that. It's going to parse the chain registry, get the SDK version, the comment version that the chain is on, depending on, on which version of the binary they're using at, at that point, the WASM version, the ICS version, and the IBC version of, of each of the binaries from each of the chains. Uh, currently, I'm already parsing this on a test version of this website for SDK. Uh, and it's important for me for two reasons. One is, I didn't find any chains on 047 yet, based on the chain registry. Uh, the other is um, there are a few security issues coming our way that uh, that were introduced in 046, and they're still present in 047. So if anyone wants to, anyone is upgrading like in the next week, uh, please reach out to me because it's too early to talk about it yet. But uh, they might want to wait a week, so we release some new versions of these of these SDKs. Yeah, so yeah, that's kind of where we're at with with versions. Um, and uh, but I am very excited to use the the new features that are present in 47. Um, so I suppose, um, I guess, unless we have any other questions on kind of the nitty gritty technical work, um, maybe we Before can switch you go over there, to- I actually have oh, a question yeah. about your updates. So you mentioned that mm -hmm. uh, Huckleberry went on and uh, and the Denim, whatever it's, what it was called, uh, issue. I actually named it, but I can't remember what it was called. Well, Huckleberry yeah. has, a, has a, a summary on the forum, so people can look it up, see what it was, how it all got fixed. But the, the Denom multisig issue, I, I didn't find anything like that. Did you do a retrospective? Did you publish it anywhere? Yeah, yeah, I did. Um... It's in the release notes um, for that release. Um, we were, I think I was integrating that stuff into blog posts as well. Um, I don't think we released that one though. Um, I think that it would be good. Maybe, yeah, maybe it is right for a forum post. Um, and uh, that that might be good. I, 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 can, I, can, I can do that. I can make a note to do that. Um, Thanks. So let me see here. Um, I can, if anyone's interested, I can explain it now. Um, I mean, you know, I don't know if we want to spend the time on that, but I think it's uh, I, I think interesting. Blog, well, or sorry, uh, a forum post would be really useful because then you, okay. can go, you can go into details about even why things were late or early or how things played out. Yeah, that's, it's, in, it's interesting. Um, it, uh, I thought it was a pretty interesting case and it happened to be like, we had a bunch of issues that happened at the same time that were like somewhat unrelated. So <laughs> it was a perfect storm, but, um, oh, then one more thing. This is as a result of just to cover that, since we're talking about that stuff, this is as a result of the delays of the neutron launch. And this is something we, we probably need to tweak in the future and do differently, but basically, um, the way that interchain security works is that the provider chain does not let uh, delegators unbond until it's heard from the consumer chain. The consumer chain's unbonding period is over. And that is to ensure that the consumer chain has the right unbonding period so that the trusting period is right for IBC. So it's all as theoretically secure as it needs to be. And um, that what, what it does mean though, is that if the consumer chain goes down, um, if, if a, any consumer chain goes down, uh, for uh, for any amount of time, it can delay unbonding on the provider chain. And um, so right now, the but it's it's also affected by the consumer chain's unbonding period. So right now, the unbonding period on Neutron is one day uh, shorter than the hub's unbonding period. And what that means is that if there is downtime on Neutron of more than one day, then the uh, unbonding of people on the hub will be delayed um, by the uh, downtime minus one day. So what we'll probably do, I think we definitely want to do this for stride and we'll probably also have Neutron get this in, you know, in the next update, uh, but it's to change the unbonding period. Maybe we'll have the recommended unbonding period be one week less. So maybe a two week unbonding period on consumer chains. 
um, so that a consumer chain can experience up to a week of downtime before uh, anybody's unbonding is affected on the hub. And that will um, that will result in kind of like, uh, you know, less, less disruption. Um, so yeah, then, um, uh, yeah, we're, oh, and then all, what I'm saying, what I want to say also was right now, unbondings are delayed. So people who unbonded, not for, not for very, it's going to be over tomorrow, but people who unbonded on, uh, like basically I think after, uh, on May 8th to like May 9th and May 10th, I believe, depending on your time zone. Uh, are going to have their unbindings complete by by tomorrow, basically, and so they've been paused for, um, you know, for yesterday and today, and and we've we've actually seen some questions um, come up on various social media, and we've we've been answering those. So that's something that's going on. So we're also just trying to kind of gauge how much it actually pisses people off, uh, but um, yeah, we want to avoid it in the future. But it's it's kind of a security trade off thing too. So anyway, did, uh, yeah. Any any more questions before we say, move on did to? They have what? his hand up or? Yeah, no. Sorry, I was going. Oh, ask, sorry, I didn't see that. That's no, right. I was going to ask. Um, obviously, right now we've just got Neutron to deal with, but I imagine um, we're going to have the same issue with every consumer chain. That's one, and the other one is when we have multiple chains, would downtime would downtime on each interact with the other and delay on bonding more? No, no. Um, it, it's it's whatever consumer. It, it what basically what the right now. It, what it used to be before interchange security was that there would be a timer uh, on on bondings. When the timer was up, uh, you get your money out. Yeah. But the way it works now is that um, there's a timer, and then there's also uh, there's also a thing which is which is basically keeping track of um, keeping track of of which which uh, consumer chains have, uh, have, have basically sent their VSC matured pack, which, which is a packet which tells the provider chain, you know, you can unbond. And so all the consumer chains have to have sent that in for the given unbonding in question, um, but, uh, and, and the time needs to be up. So it's, it's kind of a, uh, yeah, it's like all of them have to have it sent in, um, but there's no reason that, you know, they're independent of each other as long as they're all in then, then you're good so. cool but yeah it obviously increased the chance of more consumer chains the more consumer chains are the more chance there is that one's going to be down at any given time and you know chains going down for for you like a day is is not great and it's a pretty notable event for that chain but yeah if you have tons of consumer chains it's likely that's going to be happening a lot and so that's why we're probably going to going to loosen things a little bit and and switch to the switch to the week because if a chain's down for a week that's uh you know a much bigger issue but um yeah there are also other ways of dealing with it um that are a little bit harder to kind of define the security properties about um but that's something that was still kind of a matter of research delaying on bonding is kind of the simplest and most robust way to uh, handle consumer chain bonding periods cool. thank you I mute myself and start talking. Uh, let's move on to Haifa. Haifa's update with, with Udit. Yeah, sure. Um, hi, everybody. Udit here. Um, maybe I can just start with a quick, uh, just because I feel like not everybody knows what uh, their testnet program even is. Um, we are basically running two public testnets. Uh, there is a leg legacy testnet, which is called the Theta testnet, which has been running for the last uh, year or so. And then uh, at the beginning of this year, we launched a new testnet called the Replicated Security Persistent Testnet, which was used for basically supporting the Interchain Security launch. And now um, it's where we were trying to get all the consumer chains to launch before they go to mainnet. Um, so yeah, there are two main public testnets that we're kind of managing right now. Um, uh, recently, we've also started this, um, this, in this initiative called Testnet Wednesdays, um, mostly because um, there's been a ton of testnet activity with all the consumer chains, uh, pop up ways, uh, whatnot. Um, and so the cost on validator time and attention has been quite a bit. So basically, we're trying to batch all the uh, testnet work for validators onto uh, a single time slot per week, which is on Wednesday, which is happens to be today. Um, uh, other recent activities, we 
have spent basically the last couple of months supporting the launch for Neutron. We did four testnet launch rehearsals with them, which is a lot, we learned a lot. Um, and uh, also, you know, supported them through the mainnet uh, launch. Um, lots of learnings, which we're trying to incorporate into future launches for uh, consumer chains. Um, this last week, we also did the V10 upgrade on both the test nets. Um, and also the Huckleberry upgrade, uh, which was just a patch uh, release that we distributed out to uh, testnet validators. Um, today is one of the testnet Wednesdays. Um, and so uh, today's activity was the launch of Duality. So Duality launched on the testnet this week, uh, the replicated security testnet. Um, and I'm just checking the Discord now. It seems like it was successful. It's literally happening right now. Um, and yeah, upcoming, uh, we are starting to plan to launch for Stride uh, onto the testnet, the replicated security testnet, likely going to happen next, next week, if not the week after. Um, I think this, this one is going to be a little bit more challenging uh, because of the mechanics from going from a sovereign chain to a consumer chain. Um, so the way we'll be running this on a testnet is basically be doing exactly what's going to happen on the mainnet. There's going to be a second testnet, which is going to be, you know, the uh, Stride Sovereign testnet. And then we'll basically get validators to um, stop that testnet, export the genesis, add the CCV state, and then launch on the replicated security testnet um, uh, with this uh, uh, with this stride, interchain secured stride uh, chain. Um, I think we all need to spend some time understanding the mechanics a little bit better and communicating it, this out to validators. So that's going to be work happening this week. Um, also coming up is uh, Pion 1, which is the neutron testnet uh, that's interchain secured. Um, there's some kind of, uh, I think, Jahan mentioned this, there was like a, a, a database corruption issue that happened there uh, because of a, a misunderstanding on the chain security versions that they should be using and uh, they didn't use a migration where they, they should have. Um, and so um, that's gonna be upgraded as well to fix, hopefully fix that issue. Um, um, so yeah, stay tuned for that. That's likely gonna happen on June 14th. Um, other things we're kind of working on are uh, around the coordination side. I think one of the challenges that we are seeing is that um, it's, well, the replicated security testnet is not incentivized. Um, and so uh, we've had great participation and great engagement. Um, we've had up to 80 validators, hub validators participating, which is great. However, um, it's hard for us to convince validators to kind of like be like paying attention, uh, you know, when there's a new chain launch or, or whatnot, which is one of the reasons why we launched this Testnet Wednesdays initiative. Um, but we're also trying to find other ways to basically get validators engaged on this, um, particularly because we want to decentralize the stake on the Testnet. Currently, most of the stake on these Testnets is managed by us. Uh, which means that some issues that might come up get kind of like hidden because, uh, you know, we are managing these, you know, we can make sure that blocks are produced because we have, uh, we have all the stake. Um, um, so we're trying to find ways to decentralize the stake while still making sure that we can get the li liveliness we want, um, um, uh, given that the network isn't incentivized. Um, yeah, so doing some thinking there. The other open question that we have is um, we're considering deprecating the theta testnet, which is this legacy testnet that we have been running before, um, and just having a single public persistent testnet, which is the replicated security testnet. Um, basically, the concern there is that there's an additional surface to maintain. It's a bit confusing to validators having to run these multiple, multiple testnets. Um, and the value isn't super clear having one more testnet, given we already have this replicated security testnet that has a lot of attention and 
all the consumer chains are there. Um, the cons are, it's kind of unclear to me currently who is dependent on this legacy testnet. I know that the Interchain Academy has like prominently featured it. Um, a lot of like the onboarding exercises and documentation features this data testnet. And I know some of the other teams, uh, dev teams are like using it to, you know, test like uh, like cross-chain integration and stuff like that. Um, so we get to understand what's happening there. Obviously we'll, you know, if we decide to deprecate this, um, there's gonna be a long kind of sunset period and we'll make sure we'll announce it early and take some time to deprecate it. But yeah, if anybody has thoughts there, I would love to hear. Uh, that's it for me. And questions or comments? Just one comment. I think I'm. This is the first time I officially hear about what Hypo was doing in the last X number of weeks, and I really appreciate it. Thanks very much. Thanks. Yeah, I consider this to be like yeah, getting consumer chains tested and, and launched and stuff is going to be one of the most uh, challenging things um, as the number ramps up. You know. Um, so, yeah. Um, <clears throat> okay, so we do not have any consumer chain teams here right now. Um, and um, yeah, I, I can give a little bit of an overview from you know what I know, um, but I think we've already talked about a lot of stuff involving Neutron and Stride and Duality. Um, on Neutron, um, there there is actually there is some interesting stuff on on Neutron, which 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 sort of uh, has an impact on any the non you know, all use of interchain security. Um, so one, one of the things is that the uh, the load of packets to be relayed via C um, update and via C well and now via C mature packets are coming through now, but the the load of packets to be uh, relayed if the chain goes down is actually um, kind of challenging. So uh, that was something we learned during the Neutron launch was, was that um, given that it had been down for, you know, that there's been three days worth of VSC update packets sent, um, actually needed to come in with, uh, I think a crypto crew came in with a, with a very powerful machine to relay, uh, to clear out those, those packets uh, and get it running. And so um, that's interesting. They've also been having, um, some issues with um, when apparently there's some kind of inefficiency in, I'm not, I, I just saw, I was just reading about this this, this morning um, from an update from, from Andre, I think from their team, but um, there's some kind of uh, inefficiency in how downtime is handled. And so somehow how we're using it when we're reading about a validator's downtime, uh, when we send the packet to jail them for downtime on the hub, um, it causes a lot of processing load during end block. Um, and there's a fix in the SDK, which, um, which is not, uh, which I think is not out yet, uh, which, which addresses this. Um, but also maybe we'll look into how we can, um, if it's possible to address it on our side. Uh, I also don't really know though, how much of a disruption it's, it's causing for them. Um, and then also one of the, one of the things, uh, one of the sort of forward looking, uh, things in the, in the medium term that we may want to modify in replicated security is getting epochs in. So making it so that the validator set update, the VSC validator set change packets um, are not uh, are not sent every single block, but instead are sent like, I don't know, once an hour or something like that, maybe um, that would really um, reduce the load a lot. But it does seem that so far Neutron has been uh, able to handle things. Um, they, I believe they're doing stuff like when they relay uh, they they only they they batch it so they they relay a bunch of packets at once which saves money on the um, the light client updates and stuff so um, yeah there's uh, the unbonding pausing stuff um, spoke about that I think we we covered that pretty well uh, the stride launch status um, I don't want to give out strides updates for them but my latest knowledge from like this morning is that um, they're 
we're gonna, you know, they're gonna do next Wednesday, testnet Wednesdays, uh, the stride sovereign consumer um, code is gonna be tested out uh, and, and, you know, basically test the stride launch. Um, and then after that, uh, they're gonna assess when it would be good to put out the, the real governance proposal. Um, then, uh, yeah, I think we also, we also discussed the LSM module. Uh, so just, and I think we were just was discussing it with, uh, I think, Sone uh, from Notional there uh, a few minutes ago, but for anyone who's not up to date on this, uh, the LSM was created last year by Occlusion. And uh, just last month, um, the Stride team together with, uh, with, 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 a, with a bunch of others, they came up with um, some changes to it which would make it more acceptable and palatable to the Atom uh, you know, holders and Atom community. And that change is mainly putting in a global cap. So saying that only 25% of Atoms can be liquid staked, at least until we establish how safe it is. So that way having that cap, it should make it so that whatever goes wrong, it doesn't go too wrong, I guess. So um, those changes uh, have been made to it um, as far as I know. And then also there's this work on backporting to 45. Um, and, uh, yeah, once that's done, um, we'll, we'll try to get into, uh, you know, hub release as soon as possible. Um, once it's kind of, uh, I, th I think been, been backboarded to the right version and has been reviewed to the changes have been reviewed to occlusions and possibly audited to occlusion satisfaction. Uh, then we'll be um, trying to get it on the hub as soon as possible. Um, yeah, I have also some more kind of. Uh, forward-looking product stuff, uh, which is interesting stuff that we're we're sort of mulling over and thinking about, but it's not immediate development. Um, I'm wondering uh, we could I could speak about that for for a long time, um, but I'm wondering if anybody has for the rest of the meeting at least I suppose. Wondering if anybody else has uh, has any questions about anything that's been discussed here, or has anything they want to raise, um, any comments, anything before I go into that. Please go into product forward and very interesting. Okay. Um, so uh, so one of the so look, looking forward, um, I think in the medium term, um, we uh, we we want to do a few things. Uh, one is to strengthen um, you know strengthen replicated security to really make the atom economic zone happen. Um, and then the other, the other, the other priority as well that we have right now is 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 to stay on top of uh, advancements to interchain security. So opt-in security and uh, mesh security. And I actually, I, I put out a blog post about this um, last week. We'll be doing Twitter Spaces um, on on Friday. Um, and so basically, the the way I see it with replicated security, you have a lot of um, you have a lot of synergy between consumer chains. They can all trust each other to a very high degree, at least in a consensus sense of speaking. Um, and we think that this will foster tight integrations between consumer chains, and it's going to make the hub be like sort of, um, you know, the center of a super app where you have capabilities coming from Stride, from from uh, from Neutron, from you know Duality, maybe whatever other consumer chains kind of bringing their capabilities into the mix, but they're also kind of curated uh, and sort of built to integrate with each other. Um, and I think that's a very powerful thing. Um, but then, and there's also other possibilities. I'll, I'll talk, I can talk about this very briefly, but it's still in the very early planning stages, but you can do things, you can take advantage of the shared validator set through uh, stuff like perhaps making it possible to have synchronous IBC, um, which is a very hard engineering problem, but, um, but you know, it should be possible. Uh, and different things, uh, flash loans between consumer chains, um, being able to, um, sort of uh, have them have interchangeable denoms. Um, a lot of cool stuff that should be possible replicated in security that won't be possible with sovereign chains or other forms of shared security. Um, but then to speak about the other forms of shared security, uh, there's there's two main ones we're looking at right now. Uh, one is, is opt-in security and the other one is mesh security. And so opt-in security is where validators can, um, you know, choose whether they want to run on a certain consumer chain. Very straightforward, probably uh, will be relatively straightforward also to extend the current uh, replicated security code base to support opt-in security, not, not a huge change. You're just making it so that instead of having all the validators from the hub running consumer chain, it's just 
certain ones. And, and then of course, only those ones will receive the rewards and their delegators, you know, and so, and, and that kind of stuff. So, um, opt-in security, uh, what's nice about it is that if, if everything's done right, um, it should be possible to launch opt-in security consumer chains without a governance proposal. So if someone's launching like just a permissionless transaction that basically says, Hey, join our chain, be a validator. And when validators join that, they bring their entire stake from the Cosmos hub and immediately start securing that consumer chain with, with the whole stake. Um, so that means that teams, maybe even teams that want to become replicated security consumer chains, um, they can start out uh, and basically get get launched through this mechanism. And I think that's that's one of, to me, that's the most exciting thing about opt-in security um, is that permissionless nature of it and, and the possibilities for sort of quick acquisition of security through that. Uh, then mesh security, of course, um, that's been talked about a huge amount. Um, that's where delegators on various chains can delegate their stake on those chains to uh, validators on different chains. And um, that's also very cool. Uh, it's, it's very cool how decentralized it is and it's, and it's kind of a, a real step forward for shared security. Um, and I also think that the hub will be able to play a very big role in mesh security because uh, just the market cap and the amount of stake and the fact that it is, um, you know, it is, it is an, it is an asset. This is, it's kind of a place where people go to, you know, to stake, especially with replicated security. It's kind of the atoms being used to secure a lot of stuff. So it's a natural fit for it to secure uh, mesh security, um, other mesh security chains as well. So we're, uh, we're collaborating with, um, we're not doing a huge amount of technical work on it, but where we're collaborating with the uh, with the group that's building mesh security, um, really coordinating, um, and also the Atom Accelerator um, DAO. They set that up, so shout out to the Yusuf uh, and Ryan there. Um, and uh, with that, I also think I'm just kind of going through my blog post now, I guess. But I kind of think that we could bring that same kind of experience that people are going to have with opt-in security, which I think opt-in security will be most likely be done before mesh security. Um, but that kind of from that that kind of experience uh, where where people can use it to launch a chain uh, that could also be brought to mesh security. So we could set up a thing where people can basically um, set up a mesh security chain. This is still like probably years out, but um, set up a mesh security chain and um, have it launch using stake from the hub. So it starts out with a very high security from the hub as it's like sole mesh security provider. And then they go right after launch, they can then go out and connect to all these other chains that start from this really strong base of, of security. So that's that's kind of like where I feel like the hub can have a sort of, you know, sort of advantage, a unique advantage um, in the mesh security space. Uh, and then where this comes into the short and medium term, though, is um, is that I, I don't believe and I think a lot of people don't believe that it's. Um, secure to do mesh security or opt-in security without some sort of fraud proof. Um, and the reason for that, we've written about this as well in the past, but the reason for that is basically that, let's just say from the, from the case, it's easier to think about with opt-in security, but from the case of opt-in security, um, it's, uh, it, you could have a situation, opt-in security can be any validators, you know, on the provider chain, any, any hub validators could be opting into a given consumer chain. What if all the validators that are opting into a consumer chain are evil? They're malicious. Um, they could they could basically they can't double sign because they'll be slashed for that. Um, but what they could do is is just do incorrect execution. So they could just you know uh, do an incorrect state transition, which gives all the money to themselves. And without fraud proofs, there's no kind of automatic way to uh, slash them um, on the hub when they do that. And so. Um, that is an issue with uh, that's an issue with opt-in security. And the issue exists in a little bit more complicated form as well, uh, but probably a, is a worse issue even in, in, in mesh security. Um, and uh, so fraud proofs, um, just for Cosmos SDK fraud proofs, just by checking, I reached out, I, I actually checked with the Celestia team and the, and the Rollkit team um, regularly to get the status, um, but they're still in the middle of developing them, making them work. Um, I, I personally, my assessment is that those fraud proofs are not close to production yet, and it's hard to say when they will be. Um, so something that could work um, in the interim is, um, is fraud votes. So you basically just have a governance proposal 
that would only apply to validators who are opted in to a given consumer chain, of course. Um, but this proposal will be able to say this validator committed incorrect execution. Here's the evidence. Uh, and the evidence wouldn't have to be automatically handled by uh, a fraud proof <clears throat> verification engine like Rollkit is building. Um, but it's something that validators could like, you know, sync up the state, see for themselves what happened or valid or any voter really community members uh, and then vote on this fraud vote proposal. And plus, if there was something like this, if there was a major hack that happened. Uh, it would be clear to all humans involved what had happened. Someone's money was stolen. It would be pretty obvious um, in a way that like, you know, it's kind of hard to put into an automatic fraud proof verification engine. <laughs> um, and so those kind of fraud votes, these could be something, and these could be something that lets the, you know, lets the hub uh, and just the Cosmos ecosystem in general with mesh security get sort of a head start on these sort of more advanced shared security solutions um, before uh, platforms like Eigenlayer, you know, can get to the party uh, before fraud proofs are fully, real fraud proofs are fully fully working. Um, so that's something um, that I think we're going to put a blog post out about, um, you know, in the next few weeks. Uh, we're still thinking about a lot internally. Uh, there's definitely a lot of uh, edge cases and stuff when it comes to these. If you have votes where you can just have people slash a validator, it's not something you want to take lightly. Um, so I think it's something that uh, but I, I do think it would be it'd be foolish for us to overlook this opportunity. Um, so we're going to be bringing out a blog post and, and, and sort of trying to gauge community sentiment about, you know, are these fraud proofs good because they let us ship these advanced security solutions um, more quickly or, uh, you know, are, are they are they too risky? Um, and I'll just also say the alternative, if you don't have fraud votes and you don't have fraud proofs and you're running mesh security, you are re or often security, you're relying on basically the idea that if something goes wrong, then the provider chain will actually do a hard fork with a migration where the migration just manually like, you know, deletes those validators or whatever. Um, so it's a manual slash. So that that's kind of what you're depending on for the security. Um, or maybe you're just hoping everyone plays nice. Um, so, I, so I do think like if you're depending on that, it's like, you might as well make something so that it can happen within the governance system in an orderly way, instead of being some crazy, you know, hard fork slashing migration situation. So yeah. yeah. And, and um, Sam said, Sam asked, could Babylon <clears throat> offer a solution? Um, it's a good question. Um, Babylon is uh, as far. I should probably sync with it with their team again. Um, but as as far as I'm aware right now, what what they're doing is checkpointing um, to avoid uh, long range attacks. Um, and so basically, when when you when you sync up a node, and actually, it, it, it's it's uh, if I get anything wrong here, and you know more about it, please interrupt. Um, but when you sync up a node, um, you're kind of trusting that, um, or actually from the, from the light client perspective, when a light client is looking at like uh, uh, a light client update, which basically contains the proof um, for any money that's being transferred um, in, um, you know, in any subsequent uh, IBC packets, um, then they're kind of right now, they're kind of just trusting that the old validator set said uh you know that this was correct and um and 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 that this is like the new validator set and stuff and so i think with babylon what it does is it lets a chain uh take those new state roots and put them on um put them on bitcoin as well and so uh that avoids long range attacks but also from the ibc client perspective which is what i'm more interested in because that's how money would be you know taken out after it's stolen um it, um, I believe what that would let you do, if you had light clients checking that too, you would make it so a validator, so that val you would probably make it so validators can't, couldn't do light client attacks. They couldn't like basically commit like one block where everything's correct and then go in and um, go in and sort of tell the light client that something different had happened. Like, you know, hey, light client, turns out everyone gave me all their money, you know? Um, the light client could probably then look and perhaps look at Bitcoin and see, no, that's not right. Um, and and then the other thing is like, the original purpose of Babylon is to make it so you can't have a thing where people are like, 
syncing up nodes off of like a fraudulent source and then like getting to this whole alternate history. Um, so I don't know, it certainly Babylon will certainly not, I don't think stop this problem by itself, um, but it may make things a lot more, um, a lot more kind of, uh, Marius, I saw you're unmuted. Do you have a, maybe you have a better, a better explanation than I do. I think we might simplify things, but Marius, go ahead. If you are intentionally unmuted. Uh <clears throat> Yeah, uh, it wasn't intentionally unmuted, but I'm unmuted, so I can uh, reply to this. Uh, so in my understanding of uh, what Babylon is doing, so it's exactly what you're saying, yeah? It enables the unbonding period to be smaller. Because now the unbonding period is actually like two weeks. This is not something very nice for the user experience to have to lock your assets for two weeks. So Babylon will enable to have this unbonding period to, I think, one day or something. Uh, which is nice. I do not see how you will use this checkpointing to, to deal with the fraud, with the potential, uh, with a potentially invalid block on a remote chain, in our case, on a consumer chain. So the problem that we have here is that you do not trust the validation. Uh, and with messages even more. So if you don't trust the chat, uh, sorry for the background noise, I'm in the uh, So if you don't trust the chain, if you don't trust the validator set, you do not, you, you do not trust what blocks they are producing. And you cannot verify that because you need to run a node. You need to run the state machine to actually understand what a transaction will do to the, to the database. So, you either are a full node and then you can validate the transactions, but by being a full node of the of the provider, of the hub, you're not be able to validate it. So you can either do it to fraud proofs and you rely on a settlement layer that does that for you, and, or and the data availability and the entire, entire stack there, or you try to do something, but you have to look into that, right? The, the proposal that you suggested, uh, Jehan, with uh, this vote of fraud, what was it called? Vote fraud? Uh, proposal, fraud, or fraud vote. Maybe we can come up with a better name, but yeah, fraud, yeah, fraud exactly. vote. I so guess. in the end, the governance proposal that we'll check this. Um, yeah, but again, uh, maybe there is a way that we want to solve this for us. I don't see it uh, right now. So... Uh, if Sam had a, has an idea of how to, I have um, some well, effects on Babylon, by the way, a little bit, but uh, it's very. This is really above uh, my level, but I think they want to use BTC timestamps and I can add a smart contract to receive the BTC timestamps, and that's the way they want to secure it, and it would also increase on bonding time to like hours instead of fourteen and longer days please correct um, me yeah I'm... yeah so so that yeah, will yeah. Work. so clearly though that you can reduce the unborn period right because ibc is doing exactly this is doing checkpoints so with if you do this to, to bitcoin you can reduce the unborn period but in the end the only way you can tell whether a transaction is applied correctly so if it's valid you need to understand what does it mean, right? right? If you don't have this un this capacity to understand what validity means, you cannot take a decision, is it valid or not? And to, the only way to take the decision, right? You need to have a knowledge of the state machine. So if you think of Ethereum, if I don't have the EVM running, I, I don't think, you know, it's just a blob of data that is given to me in another blob of data that is some database, and I don't know what to do with them. As soon as I have the EVM, I know exactly how to apply it or how to verify if somebody applied it correctly. I, I will say though on Babylon, I thank you very much for bringing it up actually, I'm gonna reach out to them today um, because uh, yeah, it's, it's not gonna let, it's not gonna give you the ability to see the state machine like a fraud proof verification engine would or uh, like, you know, the voter participating in a vote could. Um, but what it does do is by um, by doing that time stamping, 
Uh, one of the one of the big constraints that were it's tough to design around with this fraud vote stuff and, and with the unbonding stuff I mentioned earlier that's going on right now is the fact that um, you uh, it's it's this um, it's the trusting period of IBC. And so the trusting period has to be like three quarters of the unbonding period. And if you bring, um, you know, if you reduce the unbonding period of the consumer chain, you got to reduce the trusting period. The trusting period is the time after which if there's been no packets, an IBC channel will shut down. And so you don't want that to be too short for obvious reasons. Um, so um, with, uh, you know, with this unbonding pausing, we can reduce the unbonding period of consumer chains, but then really we should be reducing the trusting period as well. Um, and then also with these fraud votes, now you need to take into account the voting time, which is another, you know, another thing in there, you're then reducing the effective unbonding period of the voting time and stuff. And it's, it's all pretty complicated. And um, it may be possible to use Babylon to basically take that off our plate and be able to have the amount of time we want for voting on fraud votes without getting into like impacting the trusting period and, and stuff like that. So that actually might be um, a pretty cool thing to look into. So thank you for, for, for bringing that up. And uh, on that note, I just want to do a time check. We have one minute left. Um, I think this has been super great for me, at least. Um, so I hope everyone feels the same way. Um, we'll be having these regularly. Jahan, do you have any like closing thoughts in the last 60 seconds? Um, no, I, I, I don't. Um, I think, um, yeah, maybe we should do like a retro. Uh, but uh, at least internally, or we can invite participants, I suppose, but maybe that's not something people really want to make time for on the calendar, but um, yeah, we'll, we'll be, we'll, we'll be working on this, the schedule for these and, you know, when we get the agenda out and, and stuff like that. Um, and how well, to handle so the screen sharing. This call, uh, thank you very much. Uh, yeah, thanks for coming. Context. You give a lot of context on like what is going to happen in the coming months. So Thank you very much for this. Uh, also, just I would like to add again, thanks for everyone for attending and Jahan for uh, actually doing uh, hosting it. Uh, but also, I would like to encourage everybody to add stuff on the agenda in advance if they want to talk about different topics. Uh, yeah, that would be great. Yep. And we'll be sure to add the agenda into the um, into the calendar invite so you can just access it right there. But again, yeah, thanks everyone for coming. And yeah, we'll be posting the video. I'll do a brief recap. So keep an eye out for that. And hopefully we'll see you guys next time. Thank you. Have a good day, everybody. Bye, everybody. Bye, everyone. Bye now.